Atrocity Stories, narratives of extreme violence and cruelty by armed men against civilians, loom so large in the literary depictions of the Thirty Years' War that some historians have been tempted to dismiss them as the accoutrements of a myth of all destructive fury or a fable of wholesale ruin and misery. There is no doubt that atrocity stories became a genre in their own right in contemporary reporting of this war. A good example is Philip Vincent's book The Lamentations of Germany, which listed the horrors suffered by the innocent, featuring graphic plates entitled Croats Eat Children, noses and ears cut off to make hatbands, and so on. The sensationalist character of many atrocity stories should not obscure the fact that they were rooted, at least indirectly, in the lived experience of real people. Official reports from the Havaland record numerous beatings, house burnings, rapes, and wanton destruction of property. People living on the outskirts of Plaue, just a few kilometers to the east of Brandenburg City, described a through march by Imperial troops on their way to Saxony on New Year's Day 1639, during which many old people were tortured to death, shot dead, various women and girls raped to death, children hanged and sometimes even burnt, or stripped naked so that they perished in the extreme cold. In one of the most evocative memoirs that survives from Brandenburg, Peter Thiel, customs officer and town clerk at Bielitz near Potsdam, described the conduct of the Imperial Army that passed through his town in 1637. In order to force a certain Jürgen Weber, a baker in the town, to reveal where he had concealed his money, the Imperials stabbed a piece of wood half a finger long into his penis, if you'll excuse me. Thiel described the Swedish drought said to have been invented by the Swedes, but widely reported of all armies and a fixture in later literary representations of the war. The robbers and murderers took a piece of wood and stuck it down the poor wretches' throats, stirred it and poured in water, adding sand or even human feces, and pitifully tortured the people for money, as transpired with a citizen of Bielitz called David Ortel, who died of it soon after. Another man, by the name of Kruger Muller, was caught by imperial soldiers, bound hand and foot, and roasted over a fire until he revealed the whereabouts of his money. But no sooner had his tormentors taken the money and gone, than another raiding party of imperials arrived in the town. Hearing that their colleagues had already roasted $100 out of Moller, they carried him back to the fire and held him with his face in the flames, roasting him for so long that he died of it, and his skin even came off like that of a slaughtered goose. The cattle merchant Jürgen Muller was likewise roasted to death for his money. In 1638, the Imperial and Saxon armies passed through the little town of Lenzen in the Prignitz to the northwest of Berlin, where they tore all of the wood and the equipment from the houses before putting them to the torch. Whatever householders rescued from the flames, the soldiers took them by force. Hardly had the Imperials departed, but the Swedes attacked and plundered the town, treating the citizens, women, and children so gruesomely that such things were never told of the Turks. An official report compiled by the Lenzen authorities in January 1640 sketched a grim picture. They tied our honest burger, Hans Betke, to a wooden pole and roasted him at the fire from 7 in the morning until 4 in the afternoon, so that he gave up the spirit amidst much shrieking and pains. The Swedes cut the calves of an elderly man to stop him from walking, scalded a matron to death with boiling water, hanged children naked in the cold, and, and forced people into the freezing water. About 50 people, old and young, big and small, were martyred in this way. The men raised by the elector himself were not much better than the invaders. They too were ill-clothed, underfed, and demoralized. Officers brutalized their men with a regime of draconian punishments. The soldiers of Colonel von Rochow's regiment were beaten and stabbed on trivial pretexts, made to run the gauntlet branded, and in some cases had their noses and ears cut off. Unsurprisingly, perhaps, the troops were equally merciless in their dealings with local civilians, prompting bitter protests against their frequent extortions, plundering, murder, and robbery. So frequent were these complaints that Count Schwarzenberg convened a special meeting with the commanders in 1640 and dressed them down for vexing the civilian population with acts of insolence and violence. But the effect of his admonition soon wore off. A report filed two years later from the district of Teltau near Berlin stated that the troops of the Brandenburg commander von Goldacker had been plundering the area, threshing the corn they found, and treating the local people in a manner as inhumane as indeed worse than the enemy. It's impossible to establish with any precision how frequently atrocities took place. The regularity with which such accounts crop up across a wide range of contemporary sources, from individual ego narratives to local government reports, Petitions and literary representations certainly suggest that they were widespread. 
What is beyond doubt is their significance in contemporary perception. Atrocities defined the meaning of this war. They captured something about it that left a profound impression. The total suspension of order, the utter vulnerability of men, women, and children in the face of a violence that raged unmastered, out of control.